Welcome to Elite Six Think Tank, an open discussion group with business owners who share their knowledge, experience, and skills. Good morning. How's everyone going? Great. 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 Hey, we've got a full house. That's brilliant. Thank you for coming along. We've got a um, topic for today is life cycle of a business. And it was uh, talked about in the last week meeting that that would be a good topic for today. So we sort of go back to a more business focus. So I did ask Lisette to explain what she meant by that, mm. and she described it quite well. So I want to start yeah. with what you talked about. Well, from what I gather in my um, reading for developing my own service offering, um, there's different needs based on, um, so you know, you, you're a startup, you've got massive cash flow problems often, um, there's a lot of um, psychological head games that you can play with yourself and so they're like, you know, the challenges of the startup and then you get to a mature, uh, so then the next stage is the adolescent sort of business where you're starting to turn over um, a regular um, cash flow and you might might start thinking about um, profit margins and perhaps employing someone and then there's challenges that come with that and then typically once you start employing someone from a knowledge management perspective um, things can often go skew with because um, you get the Chinese whispers thing going on and they start delivering the product that wasn't actually consistent with what you intended and you know you get challenges to do with that actual people management and quality control and all that sort of thing and then the next stage you start getting more systems into place and, and that's where you start being a mature business and then you can possibly start thinking about I don't know the opening branch elsewhere or and ultimately you might prepare the business for sale or um, close it down altogether so I was just interested personally because I, I'm developing you know where I sit what, what sort of knowledge management needs there are at each stage but I just thought it was an interesting topic altogether what are the different yep. stages and yeah that's uh, and, and that's a fantastic um, introduction uh, what I got from asking quite a few people throughout the week was at what point are you uh, thinking about starting a business to becoming a startup and then also when you actually say yeah I'm in business mm -hmm. and then when can you leave your business alone and go on a holiday and not freak out um, I think Mark was talking um, how his business he sort of in the last four months has determined that he has actually got a real business and he's gone past startup mode mm. yeah so what about uh, look at the experiences people are having um, has anyone had a business what wasn't really a business and then they've flagged it and then decided another right if they keep suit I'm like a, a serial entrepreneur in a way I, I, I like starting up businesses that's what I like doing but when it's not feasible I drop it or change it or um, I like to think I'm a fluid person and I change where the demand is mm. what about you guys yeah. well, I've been in a situation where I've had a business and it, uh, and it wasn't real business in the true sense of the word that I could go away and leave the business and still carry on so in my mind that's the nice definition of business did you have staff? No, I feel I didn't need stuff. Okay? And uh, that was fine. And I've, I've talked about it in the past year. It was a professional speaker's bureau. But where people could come and find themselves a speaker for a, for a conference or what have you. Uh, but I started the business in 2000 and finished it in 2010 because in, in the interim, what happened was the web developed to such a stage that people didn't need the services anymore because literally they could go to I guess speakers finding on the web and approaching them themselves. And so even though I was offering services beyond just getting a speaker, uh, in fact literally the calls dried up and so that was the time to go. That was literally the technology that I was So limited. Uh, yeah. Mark? Um, just reflecting on, on probably my own visit now as a you know, third year as an insurance broker after 
um, 30 odd years of being a school principal, um, bringing in a whole lot of skills, but being able to make or have that opportunity, as I've discussed with some of you before, I had the benefit of a one year salary package redundancy. And I know in my business, real estate's another one where if you aren't sitting on a good dollop of funds, you won't get past your first year, um, unfortunately. Because so often while you're doing, you're on that steep learning curve, you're building a client base, you're getting your head around what you actually are doing and what you need to do, you're putting in systems and stuff, but that's not paying the bills. And after a period of time, you have to make that judgment call about is this a sustainable business? Often it is, but unless you've got that, that cash injection or something out there to keep you going through that initial lean startup time, it will fail. And tragically, you know, through the people I've seen sitting around this table and, and other in our Elite Six, people have come and gone. Are gone. What's a go? Go. go. Uh, no. Come on. Oh, yeah. no. um, and they you know, the deeply passionate people, the personable, and they have all of those attributes. But sometimes, and I know, know Danny's mentioned it, he actually, as an outsider, do wonder whether their business is sustainable to the extent that it's going to provide a living income for them anytime soon. And that's always a bit of a tragedy, and we've seen that in other people. Uh, cool. Uh, Sam? Um, I've been mainly in startups most of my life, from uh, gold mining to property trading. But, uh, and you're right about having the cash injection. I always wondered why your bags were so heavy. <laughs> it's all gold. And um, it's fascinating. You know, I've been lucky enough to be able to get that cash within the straight away to be able to get going with the gold mining and property trading. But, one of the big things I've just seen recently is a friend who set up a business where a, he got given a bit of machinery. The last seven years he's been working out how to make it go uh, to convert waste plastic into fuels. And uh, just recently he's, uh, in the last four months, put together a full board of directors. And with that, uh, they've just generated their first cash uh, or, or the first, they sold shares, got the first 300k. Last week, well, this week is his first week that he's um, been on the payroll in seven years, and uh, it finishes off the. Um, uh, it's a um, peer review, independent peer review being done on it by a massive big company in Australia on this bit of machinery that they, they say it's going to be valued at $20 million in two months' time. How, how did he sustain himself for seven years? He's a tyler. <laughs> Go away. And, yeah. and he's been working it over the weekends and you know, at nights, getting up at three in the morning, studying uh, petrochemical um, papers and all sorts of stuff, and uh, and can walk the talk in front of these big boys that are coming over that have come over from Australia. So and has developed the actual machine that will do it. Well, he, he's worked out how to work the machine. He got given the machine, right. actually, yeah. Mm. yeah. So it's not and just a concept drawing, is it? It's no, reality. it's reality. They've already sent samples to labs to get it all checked, and they're just double-checking things. So, so it takes a long time, that first stage, potentially. But then, within two years, they reckon it's going to... There's four directors, which is, um, you know, some big, high-powered people. It's saying, you know, easily going to be hitting the two million, two billion dollars a year. Yeah, and come up to expenses. How's his tiling? His <laughs> dock instantly. <laughs> last week, last Friday was the last time he, he put the tools down and that was it. The, the, the worst thing I've heard people say to me quite often is uh, I'm going to take a leap of faith and start working for myself. I heard, I've known a couple of people who have borrowed mum and dad's money and haven't really done a feasibility study before they're starting in business and then they wonder why their business hasn't worked. But um, the fact that that Tyler guy had an income and he carried on working, then he had his bread and butter, you've got to sustain yourself. And, and the board of directors have seriously helped them out with the planning and advance with all that. You know, they're big people, so yeah. that's good. So, uh, other people's experiences, have you got one, Ashley? Um, it was just interesting uh, what you were saying before. And it made me think about how the um, graphic designer who created my website, I think he's a year younger than myself, he's 25, 
And he's one of the few people that um, he's creating a game which is going to be funded by the New Zealand government because it's looking at um, diversity within, um, I guess, the gaming community and his characters he's creating. And I think he saved up like 15,000 people behind him so that he could fund himself to just solely work on this game full time. And I wondered how many people put money aside in a massive chunk to fund their, themselves so that they can go out and to do business. And I just, is that done anymore? I feel like that would have been done maybe in the past. If you knew you wanted to do, have a business one day, you'd save up a ton over time so that you could put yourself in a situation where you could go all out and do it. I, I saved up $300 and started hitchhiking around New Zealand telling people I was a mobile um, website developer and my goal was to get another three hundred dollars so that was how much I charged to set up a website and then I thought I needed a passive income so then I charged thirty dollars a month for my services and it was uh, two and a half years later when I was getting in around about three thousand dollars a month in a, what I call a passive income I realized I had a business and then I decided that I weren't charging enough and I was too busy so I put my thirty dollars a month up to a hundred dollars a month and to my surprise I lost two percent of my clients and um, then I had all this money, and then all of a sudden, instead of breaking even every month, I started having a profit. And that every month went by, that profit doubled, and then all of a sudden, uh, it turned into half a million dollars worth of turnover in a year. Um, so why did you stop? Sorry. Um, why did I stop? An Americano chai. The reason I stopped, the same reason David stopped. Things changed. Yeah. And uh, you're going to make hay when the sun shines, and be ready to go. Leon. Just on that board of advisors chat, there's actually lots of really good resources and, and really great people looking uh, for various resources online. I can't remember off the top of my head, but uh, yeah, if you're looking to assemble a board of advisors, there's lots of people looking for you know experience with startups and with small scale businesses as advisors that you know are looking to have their CV and get the experience. And you may find some that are uh, you know, really relevant experience in your industry or idea. So yeah, do do look for the help because people are willing to give it. Yeah, there's a lot of startup money around, eh? Yeah. Yeah. Christchurch, is it Christchurch NZ? Or they um, will give up to $5,000 to help some businesses that might need a hand, but you've got to meet the criteria. Worth having a conversation with a the lady there anyway, I did. There's a, um, an event that's coming up on the 10th of October, I think it is, if anyone's interested. It costs $10 for a ticket, but it's specifically designed for businesses that are in the startup phase or need research being done for a particular product, I'm signed up for it. So if anyone wants the information, they can just yep. send me a message. How much money do you need to start up a company? Is it different industries, different money? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. 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 I've always started on a shoestring. Yeah. It depends what overheads you have to service, you know, whether yeah. you're sitting on a big mortgage or something that clouds your thinking. Mm -hmm. Right, what are we up to? Um, we're up to solutions, experiences, uh, who struggled to start up, who wish they never did it. <laughs> oh, Rob does wish he never did it. No. <coughs> um, I just heard a comment before about, about there's an event that's on, but it costs $10 a ticket. It's run by the IRD, so <laughs> they want some money. <laughs> so my comment is, is that usually if we start up, we think we're going to learn everything ourselves and it's going to take a bit of time, but the best person to learn it all is ourselves. And I think, how, how many people are out there, if we were to pay them a hundred bucks, eight hundred bucks, you know, like whatever, I right, could take half a year of our work off of us like that. There's a lot of people out there who, who know the information that we need to know and they charge for it because they're in business. Why do we not pay others when we expect others to pay us? There's the beauty thing about having a board of directors, you know, uh, there for the dividends. You're not paying a, 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 a weekly wage or anything. Yeah. They've got a vested interest though. Hell yeah. Mm -hmm. And they, they've really got the power oh, so behind So they're shareholders as well then? Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. That's a different level, eh? Yeah. <clears throat> well, is it, um, who said this week that they did a survey of all these millionaires and 97% of them all had one thing in common? Was that you, Chris? 
Um, is that the mentality? Just share the experience. It was just, there was a survey done recently in the States uh, across 10,000 millionaires and multi-millionaires and the strongest stat out of it was that 97% of them all had a mindset around they deserved success and there was no way it was not going to happen. 97%? 97% of them deserved Their resilience and self beliefs around their mindset was what they all had in common. Yeah. So are we high achievers or are we average achievers or we just want to work for a living and have financial freedom? It's the only 20 of the people are going for It's only 20% will succeed and another 10% of those. Mm-hmm. Top level, you, know, you want to focus, get advice uh, from those around you or people will willingly give advice. But you also got to sort of look at the risks and balance the risks and what you've got to lose. Yeah, I, if you listen to Richard Branson's book, he's pretty cool. Uh, I know he's successful and people are all right for him, but he's uh, never been a big risk taker. Would you agree with that? Yeah. Do you know why? Yeah, Because he only risks half the percent, half of his success at a time, and uh, you know, and then he's got multiple companies, but he always has a, a safety net of some sort. My safety net when I had three hundred dollars in the bank was I was living at home with my mum in the shed at the back. So I had somebody come home, somebody to come home to. I didn't have to pay a big mortgage, didn't have the overheads. Chris and David, and somebody's got a ball already. I think one of the things that we see, we've seen a few, quite a few. Hello, Chris. Yeah. Oh, sorry. sorry, I just. Sorry. Okay. Please don't. I'm okay. <laughs> You've started. This is a ball moment. <laughs> uh, just that uh, we've seen a number of companies um, that basically, when they've started, they've not run their numbers, so they haven't actually worked out their budget on what they actually do need <coughs> to deliver the business that they want in the time frame that they're actually thinking. You know, you, when, you, when you go in, you've got to think, well, do I, am I expecting this to be a business in three years, five years, seven years, one year? What's my budget need to be accordingly? Because you need to be spending on marketing and sales, not just operations, you know, outsourcing services to other people, all those costs. You've got to actually run the numbers, and the amount of times that we see people, um, we we go, "What's your budget?" And they all oh, even got a budget. We just want to know how this is going. What's your return on investment? We don't know. Mm-hmm. They haven't worked out actually what the services they're going to become, what's their margin they could get from it, and what's their time frame around when they are going to be profitable. You and don't understand. Up to three of the indicators of a failing company. Correct. I loved it when I asked a client what his budget was, and it was three and a half times more than I was charging. I just tried not to blink too quick, <laughs> but um, I did three and a half thousand dollars. Oh, I did three and a half uh, times more the work, and did them a far better job because I had a budget. I love that question when people were asking you how much. Uh, Ashley, um, I wonder with all of those people that they did the survey with, whether all of them were goal-oriented people. It was just something I was talking about with the. Um, another business owner the other day about how I feel like in order to get out of a startup, you do have to have goals that you set yourself throughout the year in order to try and get yourself into the next phase because if you just had the, I just want to be in business and I just want to work for myself and I just want to earn money, I feel like you're not going to kind of evolve into the further stages of business. So you come to yeah. You've got to have that plan. You've got to kind of keep challenging yourself to get out of those bubbles so that you can keep progressing. But is everyone here goal-oriented of people? I'm curious. Can you raise your hand if you are? Who sets goals every year? Who sets goals every six months? And every four months? So at least every six months. Every That's month. Every every I, I have a vision. Yeah, I know where I'm going. Yeah. Yeah, it's when it's lunch. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> um, we had another boy out here, David Clarkson. Yeah, it's just, just an anecdote from way back. Because remember once upon a time, and this goes around the safety net, remember one time going to a presentation by Robert Jones, back in the day when everybody and their auntie was getting into, into shares or into profit, that was the, they, they were, that was, it was almost the national game. And I can remember him saying to this group of people, if you're going to get into property, then the thing you've got to ensure is that you have your base covered. To start investing in property once you've got your your home base fixed and organised and safe. And 
in as you earn more money, that's the money that you put in the pocket that you can afford to lose it. But don't go and jeopardise potentially your home base because otherwise you're left with nothing and you're not going to go anywhere and you're just going to ruin your life. And the interesting thing was that he got that message out loud and clear to be read by some of the people on I could have, um, standing around afterwards and listening to this young couple talking about all the golden opportunities that were out there on property. And he was saying, let's get a second mortgage and we can probably get a third to fund ourselves into these properties. And I just thought, hey, you haven't been listening. So one of the things I believe is lots of, as somebody's already said, lots of expertise out there, listen to what the people are saying and then we're safe. Mm -hmm. Sorry, you can ask everyone else that. Single latte? Oh. Yeah. Where are we at? Greg Le uh, Leon. Just to follow on um, from Chris, that he's um, with seeing new clients and, and learning about the business and learning how his partner's got with forecasting and modelling and things like that. Um, running a co-working space, I see a lot of businesses and uh, a lot of co-working spaces publicly or not often say um, that back though, like the safety net is, is your income, so if you've got a, a different like a steady job, or you could rent somewhere, you know, or you could live with, you know, friends could flat share or whatever the scenario is. Um, I know a bunch of people when I wasn't one of them and I could have seen a scenario where I did this, is they just bought investment property straight first and um, they were able to find ones with like good high yield and all the rest, whereas I spent years toiling, renovating and, and you know, getting that safety net for myself. Um, and you know those those people were particularly on a different path, but you know if you're less risk adverse, I think there's still you know good good money to be made. But yeah, I guess the market drops, and yeah, the music stops, and there's no seats to sit on. Yeah, yeah most of us know if you're in the business and you've gone to the bank and you want some money, yeah. the first thing they're going to do is, is cover. Yeah, they're going to say, hey, everything's in, baby. Yeah. Cover the cover the overdraft. Um, but the, I guess the point I was making is that very often it's okay to have a first mortgage, but when you get into second and third mortgages, sure. you're asking for trouble. Mm. Literally, you you're don't exposing yourself. yourself. Yeah. Yeah. What, what's the worst trouble you could get yourself in then? I, I know people that, well, yeah, but I know people that have been bankrupt. Well, I don't know them, but the uh, rich dad's a bad guy. He's been bankrupt a couple of times and he's back into it again. They seem to have that same formula. Are they using other people's money? Yeah, but for every one of those people who are the exceptions, You've probably got 99.9% .9 of the others who have failed and totally failed and never come back. Is it failing? Well, if you're living in a cardboard box under a bridge, you probably have. No, no, I mean it. I mean, like, is it, um, well, we don't succeed at everything. If you ask 99% um, right. of um, entrepreneurs, or oh, whatever, one, yeah, the entrepreneur thing is they try 100 times and they succeed once. Mm -hmm. uh, how, but that safety net is that that's where they stop. Yeah. Yeah. But you'd probably hope that their failures aren't critical failures, though. You know, they're non-recoverable. And, and I think you need to take some business risk to maximise the gains. But those things that don't quite work out are okay. Oh, yeah, I think that risk is really cool. Yeah. I think that would be cool to discuss what risks are acceptable and which ones aren't acceptable. Yeah, just a really quick comment. With Bankruptcy, you know, it, it, it goes bigger than just the person being bankrupt too. You've got to include the social costs of all the people that were probably shafted as a result of the bankruptcy. So I don't think it's, you know, particularly cool thing to do. You know, these people that are repeated bankrupts, I um, don't think they're heroes at all. Um, it's a better way wire than just them. I, 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 yeah. I, I agree with yeah. you, you said, because... Um, yeah, and that was one of the things that actually happened to me. I got done with a construction company and a whole lot of distributors around the countryside did as well. A couple of them topped themselves because they lost everything. Uh, Don't and, no Sam. And we lost everything. Mm -hmm. And I spent uh, eight of the last 10 years paying the last of it off. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Well, I knew a guy that bought a bar and it was going bank, um, backwards at $4,000 a month. So what did he do? He bought another bar. And then when that was going backwards, he bought another bar. And eventually he was $400,000 in red. And he said, oh, well, you know. And I go, I knew him really well. And I couldn't believe he did that. And I was speaking to somebody who was a Rotarian actually telling me that he had a $15,000 orange juice bill. And he said, should I take him to claims? And he's going, no, don't waste your time. I'm not going to get money. He said, but I am. Because uh, that guy will do it to other people. Uh, you know. Yeah. I'm just touching back on what you're saying about goals and stuff. I think it's really important for any, any business to you know clearly what you want your business to be. So you talk about, people talk about their five year What's your five-year goal for your personal stuff? I hate that question. I know, right? Yeah. But what's your five-year goal for your business? I hate that question too. What is it you want it to be? What should? Because then, if you think about your business itself, it's it's actually an entity in its own right. It's not. It's greater than you. So it's almost like a baby. You know, what do you want that baby to grow into? And if you if you don't know what you want it to grow into and where it sh it should get then it's not actually going to go anywhere or just kind of bumble along and you might strike it lucky and, and get something, but if not, it's not going to go anywhere. You have to have that clearly defined pathway of thinking, well, this is where it should be. We're going to be an international conglomerate with staff around the world in the next five years. Well, how about this? I, I'm in the business of selling franchises, that's what mm -hmm. I bought. And now I've dissolved the franchise and I run meetings. But if I sticked on my vision, I, I would have um, probably regretted where it was going because I had to be fluid as well, willing to change. So what's the new five-year goal for you? Oh, I wouldn't share that in public because I wouldn't know how to describe it in 10 minutes because it's multi-level, isn't it, anyway? Oh, you have got some. Ladies first, mate. Sorry about that. Uh, oh, yeah, I do have, yeah, I do have goals, but uh, well, I do have lots of goals, actually. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'm trying to create a business that um, has a passive income. And I haven't probably got the terminology of that quite right because I still have to work for my income. You have to be present at all times. Yeah, and that's where, oh, it didn't quite go the way I thought, but, you know. Yeah. Um, I was thinking, you see people sometimes who are, they're in love with the idea of their business, but it's not working because it's not what the public wants, but it's, I don't know if you ever watch those like business makeover TV shows where someone goes in and transforms the business and half the time the business owner is the one that actually didn't want the transformation, it's everyone else around that person that voted that that person needed the most help. Um, and it's like at what point are you trying to like, you're starving yourself for this dream that you have for something that you want when it's actually killing you but you don't want to acknowledge that or recognise that. What's the from the dragon's team? I always put every idea in front of Dragon's Den because they'll pull it apart. Mm. Oh, it, uh, yeah. yeah, the last thing I want to say back to the risk factors that my mum um, taught me, she says, only invest what you can afford to lose because my parents well, almost went right. bankrupt from um, property management and that was the biggest takeaway that they got from that is that they were over investing and that they almost lost everything. So that's something that I've learned and yeah, something that I try to withhold myself. Thank you. Leon, sir. Mm. Uh, you asked the question before, at what point do you know whether you're in trouble or not? And one of the things that came to mind was when you're offside with your IRD. <laughs> <laughs> you're in trouble. Yeah. Well, I also learned some years ago that if you realise you're offside with the IRD and it hasn't sort of, they haven't quite figured that one out yet. If you go to them and say, I've made a mess, it's surprising how much they would help you get back out of yeah. 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 If you stay on side with them, they can almost be your best business partner. Yeah. Yeah. Because they do actually want to see you survive, and they will give you the structure to make it work. And some years ago, I figured I'd discovered I'd messed up my GST quite badly. So I went to them and said, I've got a problem. They sorted it. They said, right, we have to sting you 10% because of the situation. But we'll give you 12 months to pay it off. No recurring penalties, and if you pay it off in time, you know, it will, you know, all will be well. And so I did that, and all was great. So to me, yeah, don't get offside with the IRD, and they will actually help you out if you think you're heading that way. Yeah. 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 Yeah
what one of our accountants telling us about one of her new clients that hadn't filed a tax return for five years. How does that work? Rob's Woody. Yeah, how, how do you know when you're in trouble? Well, I reckon that most of us, even if we think we see goals, I reckon we don't. And I reckon we don't because we may not meet them. And if we may not meet them, we may have to think, actually, we're in trouble. If we don't set goals, we'll never not achieve them, which means we never get to the decision point of this isn't working or it's not going to achieve uh, you know, its ultimate outcome. And for about the past two months, I, I have worked more on my two businesses than I ever have in about the last six years. And I went to a workshop, event, whatever it is, right, and a guy was talking about budgeting. For the first time ever, ever, having heard this over and over, degree in business, something about that one guy said, Rob, you need to actually set some budgets out. So you can know all the information, but still not apply it until you're in the right time. And what I feel is that because I have actually set some time out in the last two months and will do go forward to actually look at my business, not just work in it, step outside it, look at it and go, where do I want this to go? What goals does it need to achieve? How am I going to achieve them? What budgets do I need? How much money am I going to have at any particular time? If we're not doing that, right, we're just floating. And we're never going to get where we want to go because we don't actually know where it is that we want to go. We just want to stay afloat. Um, if you liken business to colanders and you had five of them on the desk and one of them was you need to have money but it keeps leaking, you need to top it up, your marketing keeps leaking, you've got to keep doing it, clients, you know, and all those sort of things. Can't think of the other two. Mark, you might. No, probably not. Um, picking up on what Robert has said in print, I, I think one of the key parts in terms of determining the life cycle of a business is around that risk and risk management because that's the thing that hangs in there all the time in your own in your own life around that. The simple measure, obviously, if the income stops, well, you're in a bit of strife. But then if you're in an industry like mine where it's commission-based and it's cyclical, uh, it can lull you into a false sense of security because when you have the peak of the cycle, you've got really good income coming in there. And unless you've determined how you're going to manage the risk of low income periods and really thought that through, you're going to get into trouble when you next approach that. And I, I do wonder in terms of the long term projections, there's a lot of people like that guy you quoted about the you know, bought, bought three consecutive bars. Uh, there's a number of people out there who actually don't can't see risk and but they equally don't know when to pull the plug. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's a bad risk, you just have to pull back and step in. How long can you be a start up mode for? It's not Daryl Park, is it? No, no, no. <laughs> he owns the premises that we're in. I don't know. <laughs> what? Oh, really? They I know saw. All about the oh, yes, yes. Yeah, I'm, I went to buy a new toothbrush last night, and Colgate have the biggest range. And all of a sudden, Colgate have a cardboard box with some bamboo toothbrushes. So they recycle. But what about the other 98% of their, their range? Yeah. Crazy. Okay. I've got two bulls who's got the third one. There she goes. Um, Helen? I've been waiting, I can't remember what I was going to say. <laughs> oh. <laughs> one of those. No, um, I was going to say uh, about when you're in your own business and how you need to outsource because I found the hardest thing in my business was doing everything. Um, accounts, marketing, blah, blah, blah. And I was good at the creative side, the photography, um, getting the photos out to the clients, seeing those visions, but I was useless at all the other stuff. And, and I would read that to be in business, you've got to be a better business person than you know, the creative person. So um, I've recently got an accountant who has sorted out my books. She is brilliant. And um, it's just the way to go. You've got to spend that money and um, outsource 
because otherwise you're just, yeah, it's, it's too hard. So I'm starting to rub shorts and we're going to Without sourcing a boyfriend soon. Yeah. <laughs> Great. So is that a sign of maturity then when you start? Yeah. Oh, I, I want to probably discuss that more in depth after David actually. I was going to say it's, yeah. it's really interesting because part of this whole life cycle of our businesses is about what the business looks like in terms of the structure. I think a very good friend of mine started off in business in his own business um, in, a, in, a, in, a, in an artistic area. And he had, he started off by himself first, and then he bought a couple of the guys that were worked with him as he built the business in as shareholders. And so that was then the way that the business operated. Then he went along for a bit, and uh, the business got reasonably big and was bought out by another business. He remained the business manager and what have you, okay? Then, and he was happy with that because that bought, gave him access to more capital and that meant he could expand what he was doing and do more of the things that he enjoyed doing around that particular area. And then he went on and that, the business that, he, that he'd sold it to then decided that they didn't want it anymore and so he bought the business back again and he started running it again because that was then the structure that was going to work for him. And he got to the same situation where he needed more money to keep on doing his development. And as a result of that, he pulled in outsiders. Okay, brought in other corporate partners to provide the capital. But he found then that he didn't like working and having to account to other people for the decisions that he was making. And because the corporate thing was very often slow, so he said, to hell with that, and went through a whole other grief and he brought all those people out again. And, and what I'm saying is that basically your businesses can be fluid. The form that they see themselves as you see them at one particular point in time doesn't necessarily mean that that's the way forward for you and there can be other solutions. Don't close your mind off to that because you can get also outside the and also outside the when I started with my $300 in the bank, I couldn't afford to hire anyone else. Maybe I could have partnered with somebody else at the time to you know, actually do the work, and I could have been a salesman. So that, that thinking. But I think you know, if you're looking at a business, um, scalability, uh, is your business scalable? And if it is, then you bring in other people. Is that where you get to a point where you start up, you've done your start up, you made a bit of money, and then all of a sudden you can't get any further? The plateau yeah, because the, the idea of Helen getting a, an accountant wasn't her idea. It was me sitting here looking at her zero account saying, you've got 500 reconciles to do. <laughs> you can't do this job. You need to get somebody to help you. And she was stressed about it. So then, voila, here's the solution. Accountant sat there and went, vroom, done. What next? And she's going, oh, that monkey just got lifted off my back. Uh, but she's got the money to pay the accountant. Right. You've actually just raised quite a good point. It's probably been mentioned, but this whole idea of recognising what you can do and what you can't do, <coughs> yeah, what your strengths are and what somebody else's strengths are, and just having the fortitude, I suppose, to be able to say, you cannot do this, you can't do it, I'll just pick it the bill. Mm. Okay, so, so why don't we start a company today yeah. and use everyone's strengths in the room? What would we lack? That's where I wanted it to go. Because uh, there will be other problems that we have to face. We have to face one person's after the money, one person's after the lifestyle, one person doesn't want to work on Wednesdays. Nobody around this table wants to do the employee job. So that's right. That's true. Yeah. So what would we start just out of curiosity? Well, we I think the problem would be a chaos of I've got the pills for the immorality. He's licensing everything out, doesn't he? Employees. Mm. Is there people who want to get involved in that? Obviously, there is. Yeah. And you find those sort of people. What about councils? Yeah. 
Secretly, I'll hope one day come, somebody comes along and goes, I really like Elite Six, you know, here's a million bucks for it. And I'll go, oh, no, 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 I really like what I do for work. <laughs> 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 and I'll say, yeah, it's not about the money. <laughs> 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 it's about the notes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But, I mean, is that, uh, is that the other side of business too? You build up a business, it's, it looks healthy from somebody else's perspective, and then you sell it to them. Is that wrong? Well, you said there you go. I was say, um, there was an amazing fish and chip shop that was close to my house when I was growing up in Australia. And it was a Greek family that owned it, and two brothers and a wife and a son worked in that fish and chip shop. And what they used to do was that they would take on a fish and chip shop, they would build up um, uh, a huge network of customers, they made amazing fish and chips, they had quality customer service, they always used to give children lollies, so children would always want to go back say, oh, can we get fish and chips? Oh, no, no, no. Um, and then when it was doing well, they would sell it and they would take on another fish and chip shop. And that's just something that they used to do. Um, and I think my dad always kind of admired them for that. Yeah. I love the story I heard this week. And uh, there's the F, and I might not have the story right, but I think I'll give it a go. F45 in Ferrymi, he owns the building. He bought a F45 franchise. He put them in the building he owns. He signed F45, his business, up for an eight-year lease and now he's put his building back up for sale, advertising he has an eight year lease signed up. And instantly that would have probably made him a few good hundred thousand dollars uh, out of his building. So that sort of thinking I think is very smart, but he had to have enough money to buy the building and theoretically buy the franchise to make the money. So money makes money? What's F45? Sorry. High intensity, but it's very expensive, that's what it is. Yeah, very expensive. Yeah, but this one's jealous of the two that are turned on. I'll get it. I'll get it. Depends on how much is going to be. Over here by the door. It's an exercise. Where are we up to? Is it Rob, and then Helen, and then Vicky? Okay. Money is the end product of helping other people. So if we're not making any money, we're not helping enough other people. Simple as that. Otherwise, they would be buying our product or our service and more and more people would be doing it. So if you don't have a goal to be a millionaire, maybe you should, because if you're reaching profit of a million bucks, you've helped a lot of people along the way. The question I have though, um, on a totally different topic, back to our original topic, is if we didn't own our business that we own or run today, but we bought it today, and we had that mindset that we've just bought this new business that looks exactly like our one, what would we change tomorrow to make it better? Quite a good question, actually. We'll probably part that just for a bit. We'll go to Helen and then we'll go to Vicky. She's still uh, with us. Uh, no, we're going to Helen first, then you. <laughs> right. um, touching on what Jamie said about selling business when you're at a point where you're making a decent amount of money, I one of my online stores that I'm running is doing really well, and Jamie has suggested selling it, and I just I can't do that. I'm like I can see that money coming in, and I'm like. I'm at a point where I can see it continuing and um, I don't really want to sell it. It's so, for sale. It's for yeah. sale. Just in case. <laughs> <laughs> Are you so, sticking there? Stay yeah, with it. Stay so with it's, it. you know, where is that point where you go, yes, I'll sell it and, you know, reap the rewards or you keep it and you keep going, you know. What do you want it to be? What your goal yeah. was, yeah, if you yes. did sell, what would you do with the money and could you Probably do that it twice? In, yeah, into another yeah. business. Because Better I want to get a few more of these. But you, yeah. Need, yeah, you need to grow the other business to be equivalent to that and then you can position yeah, yourself. True. And do you need yeah. to sell it yeah. to get money to grow the other business or can you leverage yeah. the business you've got? Yeah. yeah. Do we just yeah. own a weekend can of work? Yeah. Um, Vicky, are you with us? Money creates money. Um, is a really interesting uh, concept. Um, there is a new business that started up, um, I mean I have a small uh, tour, tourism business and um, I've got two actually and um, one is accommodation and the other one is um, you know, taking tours on the Banks Peninsula. Now there is somebody that's just started up with a lot of money 
um, already they're in the top 10. They only started in April, and already they've been able to get on the top 10 with a couple of reviews here and a couple of reviews there. So, um, so obviously they've bought their way 150 bucks a month to be in that top 10, and that's what money, and so they will just keep creating money. And I just found out the other day, how the hell did they get in the top 10? They've only been going since April. Right, so what is the top 10 things to do in, in Christchurch, Canterbury? And I clicked on it, and they pop up. Right? Jesus, they've only been going two minutes, but already they've been able to buy themselves that top 10. And I think, you know, and it's just that, and you think, you know, you, you slog away for two and a half years, and, and you've got all the, you know, you've got all the things all set up, and I, I've got farm tours yesterday that I've just set up, and some really cool stuff for people to do, really top quality. And, and yeah, these guys come along and they just. Do, do you know what they probably did? They hired a marketing department. Yes, so it's valuing the advertising dollar. That is, is the, and, and the difference probably is that they. They've come in to business going, our goal is in the next, within 12 months, we're going to be in the top top five companies. And therefore, they've, when they've worked out their budget, they've then poured X amount into the marketing and sales yeah. purely for that goal. Because that, ultimately, that's what's going to achieve that quick win of getting visibility will be money in marketing and sales. There's yeah. just no other way around it. Organically, you can grow underneath, so that's a longer term play and that's a stronger play but to get straight away and so they've got that business goal where they want their business to be is that in 12 months we want to be here so to get there these are the numbers my return on investment this is what I need to spend and I've allocated that budget accordingly into a marketing and sales department to yeah. achieve yeah. that. I didn't realise that you actually could pay to be in the top 10. I knew that you could pay to be kind of higher up. If you gave everyone here 50 bucks we would all write you a review. Because that's what paying does, isn't it? Yeah. And if you say, hey, you guys, hey, you know my business, search for Araki tours, yeah. close enough, and give me a tour, they all go out here and do nothing. But that's what advertising dollar does. Yeah. It makes people do things for money. Yeah. And that's the reality of it. Yeah. The next thing you'd have to, they'd ask you, what do you want me to say? And you go, oh, we did that here one day, didn't we? Yeah. 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 No, really good stuff, guys. Um, we've got 10 minutes left. And we um, we need to sort of think where we're at. And we had um, Stephen. Yeah, just following up on that, um, quite a while ago, I got commissioned to do Billy Hayes Restaurant in Akaroa. It was fish and chip shop. And the client said that he wanted to be world famous. Now, the day you opened Billy Hayes World Famous Restaurant, that's how he advertised it. So he was world famous from day one. <laughs> and everyone that went past, you saw everyone looking up world famous Billy Hayes, and they were wanting to go in there. And that's how he marketed it. That's brilliant. And I thought it was very clever to be where he wanted to be immediately. I've got press articles of myself as New Zealand's leading internet consultant. And somebody challenged me on that one day, and I said, there's no industry as internet consultant. And I feel I am the leading one. And until I'm proven otherwise, um, like we're off. So six weeks later, I had all these articles from the guy who thought he was the uh, number one internet consultant writing about me. It got me quite well known. And he was offered a million dollars for a domain name called 7am.com and he turned it down because he thought he knew better. He got done by the IRD a few years afterwards for not paying $180,000 of the tax. Doesn't exist on the internet much anymore. <laughs> but, you know, what was wrong with doing that? I'm not the leading one, but I think I am. <laughs> um, as, as we turn the focus back onto the life cycle of the business. Uh, Thanks, Rob. You're so focused. Um, I, think, I think there's actually four, aren't there? You know, is that right? There's, there's uh, the start, growth, mature and decline. Don't quote me on that. What about the thinking about it what first, about before you start? start I wouldn't start before I knew what I was doing. Well, it was only four stages. Yeah. Well, we all assume that I'm right, and, and I could argue that quite strongly. Um, so, 
maybe it's an idea to have a look at our own business and say, okay, right, so where on that scale are we? Because if we are at the mature level, which which could be construed as our earnings are steady, they're not increasing, the scope at present is not that we can expand upwards, sideways, or whatever. Um, perhaps we might want to have a look if we are at that steady stage. Can we actually expand upwards or outwards? Or is this where it's going to be? Right? And if it is where it is, and, you know, and this is basically what we're going to get, is, is that the time to get out? because another person may come into your business, have a, have a look at your income and think, wow, I could escalate it to blah, 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 and I would buy it and pay good money for it. Whereas you know your business better than anybody else, and you may think, actually, no, I don't think you can grow this, and if you're prepared to pay me money, I'd get out. My dad sold his, his business that he thought was worth $100,000, and a person offered him 120 straight off. And he went and told a friend who said, oh, I didn't know that you were selling. And he said, well, I wasn't. But this guy offered me 120000 He said, well, I would give you two hundred. Oh. And, and he went back to the first guy. By the end of the week, he'd sold his business for four hundred k. And But the guy that bought it was his best mate, and it's now worth over a million bucks. My dad was happy, though. You know, he got out, you know, he's retired now. That's cool. Um, there's a real good podcast called 10 Times Talk.com, and it says if you times your business by 10 with the systems and processes that you currently use, travel with you. And if the answer to that is no, then you've got to ask yourself the next question why are you using them? And I've always thought about that as your business is scalable. What is that? So, what's it? Oh, yeah. Um, sorry? What's the name of that? Um, we'll have that on the uh, thingy too, but 10 Times Talk.com. Uh, Sean? I'm going to do the same. Four stages. So, um, from my point of view, um, if my business is going to the end of the life cycles, I was trying to, I will be trying to um, get some new stuff, maybe reborn again. So, if I want to keep going, I will. Uh, out a way um, to develop a new project or maybe a stock which is uh, suitable for the new market. Not really a new market, you know. <laughs> Thanks for clarifying that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, I say so you revitalize your business, get it groomed for selling. So, so if I want to go in further down, so what I've planned it is so first of all, you have a curve like this and then you know you're not going like this you're gonna have margins and then you're gonna go down so you have another curve join in and then just keep going like a wave mm -hmm. so that's what I'm trying to do I'm not really just doing the one sense mm -hmm. I was trying to uh, get some new stuff even though it's not really making money or you know maybe maybe saying to me Makes it more stable. Yep. So, yep. Are you having lunch breaks? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Still no. Oh, He's going to have lunch breaks. That's his yeah. new thing. We want to know your timetable for lunch breaks. <laughs> We've got five minutes left. I got, and, uh, I got, I got a sandwich. Sandwiches. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, last, last one, then we'll go into takeaways. Just I'm touching on what you're saying. A lot of times people have been talking about um, sort of life cycle business related to income. Would we class say Uber as a startup or a mature business because Uber doesn't make any money they're so far down the rabbit hole that's crazy but are they a startup or we see them as a mature business they don't see themselves related to income at all they have their vision of where they're going and the fact they're down the hole now is part of that that vision what about Lime Scooters um, their Lime Scooters need to be on the road quote me if I'm wrong 127 days before that business is feasible. The lifespan of a lime scooter is 29 days. 
So that business, and it's worth billions, theoretically. Mm. Uh, what about Amazon? Is that making money yeah, now? So Amazon, yep. same yeah, same way. Yeah, they, they are now, aren't they? Yeah, is it zero? 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 Another one that's been making it for a yeah. while. Bonjour, I don't know. <laughs> um, okay, so um, we, we need to come up with a kind of a topic for next week, and we also need to sort of um, share the takeaways you got from today. I'm just wondering if we heard about, um, it came through often, managing risk within our business. Risk? Yeah. Business risk? It's, it's, That's an idea? That's a crucial one. Risk? Mm-hmm. Risk management. Protecting themselves. Well, a rainy day. Identify yeah, the pers- the personal guarantees and everything you do just in case it goes haywire. Yep. What about uh, calculating the ROI on your business? The return on investment? Yeah. Yes. Um, yeah. Are we up to that level? I mean, that's a funny one. I mean, like um, Rob was sort of saying, we're too scared sometimes to actually look at the figures. Yeah. But it is really important. And sometimes it's quite rewarding. I've just realised that the blue line in zero is better than the grey line. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but um, then I go back years gone by and I go, oh look, they're all about the same, I'm breaking even all the time, you know, and all of a sudden I've got this big spike and I go, what's that for? And they say, you've made a profit. And now I'm freaking, freaking out because I might have to pay tax. But maybe that's an indication of a change in the life cycle of your business that now you are looking at the numbers and paying more attention because your business has matured another step that the numbers now are, oh shit, I better actually check if this is actually good, what's going on. Now what's the most important thing in a business? Health. Health? Health. What is a business? Is it a passion? Oh, you're so superficial. All right, so just um, <laughs> anyone else got any takeaways from today? You come here today and you're left with what? Quiet and cheap seats. You've ever got a business or an idea with an overdraft? Yeah, no morals. <laughs> 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 yeah. So, you don't have to have morals in business, is that what we've well, really got? That's what you leave with today, I'm sorry. This is probably the biggest turnout we've actually had, so thank you for coming along. Um, next week, I'm thinking risk does actually sound quite good, risk management. Is that a good topic? It is. It's cool. personal Yeah, personal. Um, uh, oh, yeah. Take away no one's sure today. Sorry to jump in. <laughs> yeah. I would just go to Leon if we can listen to what Leon says. Oh, no, this is really good. Woo! Oh, no. Woo, woo. woo. Yeah, it's still my time. <laughs> my time. Um, I was just reading the board um, trying to think about some of the takeaways, and I really liked what you said about. Um, bankruptcy piece actually affects so many more people. Like we often, you know, serial entrepreneurs and, and the, the level of failure is, is different, you know, to people trying something and, and pivoting rather than like the critical failure when you hear, you know, it, it affecting multiple other businesses. Like, so really, yeah. yeah. So, social entrepreneurs don't sit well with me personally because they're using other people's money for their idea, but they're not taking the risks. But serial entrepreneurs, I call myself a serial entrepreneur, where I start up one thing after another. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's a good, um, it's a good difference. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so are we risking other people's money or our money? It would be part of the risk conversation next week. I think so. I think it's quite good. Yeah. And we'll see if it turns into return on investment. Mm. I don't know what that is. Yeah, I like what you said, Rob, too. What did Rob say? We like that Rob said what? It's um, good. Just it was good though. Good job. So return on investment is to set up uh, on how you would sell it. So you would sell your business on the return on investment as an idea. Yeah. 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 <laughs> if you put it on the market and I get a new car, maybe. Oh, wow. <laughs> you got a new car. Yeah, yeah, okay. Don't worry um, in case you haven't noticed, I have got a recording device here, and I just wanted to try something new. So uh, yesterday I actually set up a podcast for Elite Six, and um, I've got a new recording device coming along, and I just wanted to see if we can capture some of this, um, what's going on in this room. I won't be using it anywhere else, but with the podcast idea, I actually thought I might actually do a few one-on-one interviews. Or if you're keen, I'd like to get six people together and have a different type of discussion in a round room and just see where that went. Um, I think this is where um, I like technology going and it's quite exciting doing something different.
So uh, if you want to um, listen to the podcast or go through the notes, hopefully the recording we've done today is good enough quality. Um, but you will go to, you can find it off Elite Sixes website called Podcast. So that's it. I'd, I'd really, yeah, you've got a massive amount of people wouldn't inspire people when you're thinking we interviews. Well, not many. Yeah, I'd love to hear you. People's backgrounds are actually uh, incredible, mm. and the, the amount of people who have had different hats always blows me away. Right, go home, make some money. <laughs> Let's be careful out there.